important principle in the practice is having respect for concentration. This means your own concentration and the concentration of the people around you. Because concentration is the heart of the path. It was the first factor of the path that the Buddha discovered. You probably know the story. Practicing austerities for six years, seeing that that didn't lead to the the deathless happiness he was looking for. So he reflected, is there another way? He had already tried the path of sensual pleasures and seen that that didn't go anywhere. Then he thought of the alternative. He spontaneously, at one point in his childhood, entered the first jhana. And he asked himself, why am I afraid of that pleasure? There's nothing unskillful about it. There's nothing blameworthy about it. Could this be the path? And something inside him said, this could. So he practiced to see if that was right, and turned out it was. And as he later said, all the other factors of the path are handmaidens or requisites. In other words, they help ride concentration along. But the concentration is the heart of the path, because it's when the mind gets really still that it can see things, can understand what's going on inside. So you really want to have respect for that, because that connects to something else you should have respect for, which is for the principle of true happiness, the happiness that doesn't harm anyone. Happiness is blameless. The happiness like that is hard to find in the world. For most any pleasure you can think of, there's some environmental harm or some harm for human beings. But being able to sit here and get your mind still harms no one. And then finding the true happiness that that leads to a happiness that doesn't depend on any conditions, that's even more harmless. So this is a noble path leading to a noble goal. You want to have respect for that. Our culture teaches us disrespect for almost everything. And there's a lot out there that has been masquerading as something deserving respect and has been shown to not really deserve it. So a lot of us become skeptical. But that skepticism can spread into areas that are really harmful, like being skeptical about virtue, skeptical about the path, the possibility of a true happiness. You can get some Dharma teachers saying, well, you know, the Buddha wasn't all that awakened after all. He still had his shadow side. He still had his doubts and emotional issues. What does that leave? leaves us nothing. Everything else in the world just swirls around. But the Buddha insisted that this is something of essence. The word he used, sara, can mean heartwood. There is this essence. It can be found through the path. The path doesn't create it. After all, the essence itself is uncreated. But the path gets you there. And so you're taught to have respect for your desire for that true happiness, your respect for the path, respect for the desire of other people to practice the path, too. We're living here at a monastery together. We've got a lot of people here. At least it's a lot by our standards. So you have to be very, very careful about what you do, what you say, how you interact with others, because that has an impact on their, their quest for happiness. So in that sense, you want to have respect for other people's concentration. When you're being critical, try to be critical in ways that doesn't, in ways that don't stir things up. Try to find the right time, the right place. That sign on the front of the guest house. Why am I saying this? Is the is your speech true? Is it beneficial? Is this the right time for that kind of speech? Always run everything through that filter first. And if you notice that other people around you are not using the filter, well, just let that pass. 
But remember that the ideal is that we are practicing all the factors of the path here, including right speech, right action, right livelihood, mindfulness, effort. So that they can help the concentration along. Because when the mind is concentrated, you're taking all the elements of your experience that ordinarily cause suffering and you turn them into a path. The breath here. We can suffer a lot around the body, but we learn how to breathe in a way that's comfortable. Feelings. We can work ourselves up into all kinds of problems about feelings of pain, physical or mental. Or remembering feelings of pleasure we had in the past that are long gone, which gives rise to more suffering. But instead we learn to take feeling and make it part of the path. We learn how to breathe in a way that feels really good, feels really nourishing, energizing when you need energy, calming when you need to be calmed. Use your perceptions, all the names and labels you have for things, the images you have in your mind, to stand for things. And try to create a perception of the breath. Create a perception of yourself as a capable person, someone who's capable of meditating. Other people can do this, why can't you? Then there's fabrication when you're talking to yourself about the breath, and there'll be a fair amount of talking as you're trying to get the mind to settle down. This inner dialogue is too weak a word, there are many voices in there. But you can talk to yourself about the breath. How does this breath feel? Is it good enough? If it's not, well, what would make it better? That helps you focus on what the real issue is, is you've got to get the mind to settle down in a place where it likes to settle down. So you do your best to create that nice spot. And then your consciousness, which could be aware of all kinds of things, you devote it to being conscious of this process getting the mind to settle down. Don't pay attention to anything else. Even the voice of the, the talk here, let that be in the background. These things are called aggregates, and ordinarily we suffer a lot because of the aggregates. But it was the Buddha's insight as a strategist to see that we can take these aggregates and learn how to engage in them skillfully, because aggregates are actions. English translation aggregate is kind of unfortunate. It sounds like gravel. But these are actually activities of the mind, activities of the body. So we bring them all together in a way that's really skillful. And then try to have respect for that. It's all too easy to overlook the well being that can come from concentration. So you show some respect for this. Care for it. Look after it. This is where the principle of heedfulness comes in. You've got to realize that your actions have a huge impact on the pleasure and pain you experience, the pleasure and pain other people experience. So you want those actions to come from a good place, a place where you're alert, have a sense of inner strength, so you don't have the weaknesses that make you give in to unwise or unskillful intentions. So tend to this. Try to keep this going as you go through the day. So that whenever the opportunity comes or the necessity comes up that you have to speak or engage with other people, you're coming from a good place. So the karma that comes from that interaction is good karma, and your words and deeds can be a gift to the people you're engaged with. All too often the gifts we give and other people in our words are like boxes of snakes. We slip them into their hands and they don't realize what's happened, and then they take them back and discover they're being bitten by snakes for the rest of the day. to try to get so that your words are coming from a place of concentration, 
from a heart of gold. So it might open up in the box there. It has a nice heart of gold. That's the ideal. And the ideals the Buddha sets out are not impossible. He really means for us to take them seriously, to show them some respect, to make them bigger than our feelings and our opinions and our notions. Because it's a path that really works. But it requires sensitivity, it requires heedfulness, all your good mental powers. And the same holds for everybody around you. It requires all their good mental powers, too. So you want to make sure that your interactions are conducive to helping people stay on the path. Because this is the thing in the world that is most worthy of respect. And this is why we bow down the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha, why there's so much bowing down all over here, to teach us an attitude of respect for what's worthwhile within ourselves and what's worth, worthwhile here in the world. In other words, the teaching that the Buddha left behind. We're still fortunate. It's still around. So have some respect for that, because that's what keeps the opportunity for true happiness open. <laughs>